Hi, this is David Merlin. Just a quick reminder, there are materials of mine at thebookpatch.com. I go to thebookpatch.com, click on Bookstore and Search, and my last name, Search Merland, M-Y-R-L-A-N-D, brings you to a page with my publications on them. Hybertson versus United States, Volumes 1 and 2. This is a publication I don't mention nearly enough. It's a book of citizens' initiatives, more than a hundred of them in one place. Uh, there's a, almost, I think, a dozen proposed constitutional amendments, discussion about all of them. Uh, just a wonderful idea, the citizens' initiative. There's a lot of a lot of problems you can take care of through the citizens' initiative. Uh, the left makes, uh, makes waste of everybody with uh, a lot of their initiatives drives. Public vehicular travel. This is a brief and a criminal complaint about the fact it's racketeering. The Motor Vehicle Code's never been written to apply to any uh, anybody other than those using the highway as a place of business. It's a statutory uh, analysis based on Washington State, but I suspect it's the same everywhere. The original motor vehicle codes were only written to apply to commerce, and they've never been broadened through an expression of legislative intent to embrace new objects within the scope of the law. Take from Caesar, Volumes 1 and 2. Volume 1 is a complaint to Congress, January 1st of 06, to 80 members of Congress. Key issues about the tax code, especially, you watch my other videos here on YouTube, key to the code video, and um, the uh, Section 83 tutorial. Uh, very big, and then there's the supplemental briefing of 014, uh, several years later, eight years later. Code Breaker, the Section 83 equation. I'm still the only one in the known universe is teaching this uh, application of tax code Section 83 to every paycheck. Uh, everybody agrees it applies to all compensation, and they won't talk about it. They'll penalize you for asking in tax court. And currently, and it happens to be February 2nd, 018, uh, two or th uh, three people will be petitioning the Supreme Court with that involved uh, very soon, right out of my office. The last one, two POTUS. This is a criminal complaint filed with the new president, Inauguration Day, about these very issues. And... Uh, so peruse thebookpatch.com in their bookstore. Search for my last name, Merlin, M-Y-R-L-A-N-D. Now to our featured content. Thank you. Hi, this is David Merlin. Another installment of Codebreaker, the tax grand jury appearance February 27th, 2018, a Tuesday, the target of the investigation tells of his encounter with the vampires. This is an interview about vampires. Exculpatory evidence was withheld from the grand jury. The, the reason he appeared before the grand jury, uh, he was not subpoenaed. He sent a request to the grand jury under a particular paragraph of the U.S. Attorney's Manual, as you'll see. Sent a request saying, hey, I'd like to appear before the grand jury. And the prosecution wrote back and said, uh, we'll give you 15 minutes. If you waive rights against self-incrimination and uh, let us examine you in front of the grand jury first under oath yeah okay so he went in there and he had some documents he'd like to pass off to the grand jury but was refused by the prosecutor well uh, the uh, US attorney's manual says it's an opportunity to tell his side of the story and if you can't present your documents what if they're part of the story uh, it doesn't say anything in the prosecution's invitation about not being able to present exculpatory evidence in the form of documents. And uh, picture it, the definition of innocence, one of the definitions, a good faith misunderstanding of the law. Well, what if it's on paper? 
I can't give this evidence of my innocence to the jury, uh, the grand jury. Are you going to do it, prosecutor? Because the prosecutor didn't let the grand jury have the request to appear. It has a bunch of stuff in it. It has the two key legal arguments. Uh, you want to watch the video called Key to the Code here on Take from Caesar. Key to the Code. Uh, the tax code not written to apply to Americans. And the other video you want to watch is the Section 83A tutorial. Two and a half hours. Sorry, but it gives you everything right there. Those two arguments are framed in the letter that went to the grand jury that the DOJ won't let the grand jury see. So, what that says is that this, while it, it should be treated as an opportunity to build the record by the, the subject of the investigation, it's really tilted toward the prosecutor. We'll get a bunch of testimony out of this guy under oath, and he only gets 15 minutes. He can't give them documents, so they can't see the case law that says Section 83 explains how to tax his pay. Oh, that's real handy. So, uh, as somebody, of course, not as able as I am to articulate the arguments, uh, he floundered a bit, as you'll hear. Uh, you'll hear, uh, he'll tell you for about 20 minutes how things went. And uh, the it was an opportunity. He got to say plenty of times that uh, the law is fine, it's clear. And uh, they asked him, well, you're, do you know of a certain accountant? He says, yeah, that's the accountant that our company uses. Well, he mentioned 61A. And this guy brilliantly said, well, you have to remember about 61A. It starts with four words, except as otherwise provided. So when I look at this statute, it's not the whole story. That was quick thinking on his part. That was very quick thinking. So uh, anyway, we're going to get to uh, the interview of this man who appeared yesterday morning, February 27th, Tuesday, 2018, before the grand jury. <clears throat> but first we're going to go through the request that he sent and the reply he got from the DOJ saying, come on down. Now, uh, you see that uh, his request went in uh, just a couple weeks ago. Please, it, the location isn't important. It's irrelevant for these purposes. Nothing came of it. Hopefully, uh, the grand jury looks at at his demeanor and listen to what he had to say about the law, what he was allowed to say about the law. And he got into Section 83 a bit and uh, and said, uh, it's just the law, as you'll hear. Uh, I don't need to frame uh, what he had to say. He's very articulate. So this is the request uh, regarding, this is a sworn statement concerning relevant statutes and a request to be subpoenaed. And this did not go to the grand jury. The DOJ intercepted it, but he verbally told the grand jury, subpoena me so I can give you documents. Sirs, I am writing you to request that I be given the opportunity to testify under oath in a matter before you which concerns me. The rule below is excerpted from the United States Zone Manual. This is USAM, U.S. Attorney's Manual. Request by subjects and targets to testify before the grand jury. It is not altogether uncommon for subjects or targets of the grand jury's investigation, particularly in white-collar uh, cases, to request or demand opportunity to tell the grand jury their side of the story. While the prosecutor has no legal obligation to permit such witnesses to testify, a refusal to do so can create the appearance of unfairness. Accordingly, under normal circumstances, where no burden upon the grand jury or delay of its proceedings is involved, reasonable requests by a subject or target of an investigation, as defined above, 
to testify personally before the grand jury ordinarily should be given favorable consideration. Well, here I am. I want my, my appearance. Get me before the grand jury. Such witnesses may wish to supplement their testimony with the testimony of others. The decision whether to accommodate such requests or to reject them after listening to the testimony of the target or the subject or to seek statements from the suggested witnesses is a matter left to the sound discretion of the grand jury. <clears throat> well, what if he knows people? Hey, I've known uh, Jack for 20 years, and he's always impressed me as somebody that does not believe for one minute that the IRS is legitimate, that he has a duty to file or to pay. That means he's innocent right there. Does he have somebody like that? That might be this other person that he might want to suggest they subpoena and interview. So, if you were to place the tax code and its six volumes of regulations in one stack, uh, over 20 pounds of rice paper, I have a 1992 version uh, that I did my final work on uh, before writing my 1994 treatise. I can see it. Right now, I'm looking right at it. Two volumes of the tax code, six volumes of the regulation. I put it in a bag and went down to the grocery store and weighed it on the vegetable scale. 22 pounds of rice paper. Well, what if one of the definitions of innocence is where the law is vague or highly debatable, a defendant lacks the requisite intent to violate it? Vague or highly debatable? It's 22 pounds. And they won't even talk about the statute that explains how to tax the workforce, Section 83A. That's at least vague or highly debatable. It's illegal in tax court. They'll penalize you for asking. As we go through this, at any time, you can uh, pause the presentation and read uh, what's in the letter. Here you have the two arguments. See number two, all properties of cost, section 83, and 1.1-1 deviates from section 1. It's the regulation that's supposed to implement section 1, the graduated income tax. Section 1 doesn't mention anybody's citizenship, and the regulation does. That's a deviation from statute, first, and secondly, I allege they acquired authority by writing a regulation that deviates from statute. So number one, does it deviate from statute? Number two, did they gain authority? And if you took away the regulation, what is the limitation of their authority now? Well, it looks like Americans, citizens of the U.S. as they call them, are only mentioned in regulation. Here we go. Uh, there's, couple, there's fireworks here I'm going to touch on that you'll see where they run, they run. This is a judgment you haven't seen unless you have Take from Caesar, Volume 1, the U.S. versus Robert A. Rant decision, Seattle, 2008. You can pause again. Now, this case, Walden versus U.S., 2005. This is before the um, 2006, New Year's of 06, criminal complaint to 80 members of Congress. The court order in Walden versus U.S. was exhibit number one in the complaint that went to 80 members of Congress because the judge, Lee Yeekel, issued a protective order against these questions about whether or not 1.1-1 deviates from statute. <laughs> a protective order. He issued a protective order against the argument. And that's exhibit number one that went to Congress. You bet. Now, in U.S. versus A. Rant, Seattle, 2008, this guy came to me and said, uh, I've been sued because... I operated what they call a warehouse bank, where I have a, an LLC, a limited liability company, and I open up a bank account. You put your money on account with me, 
and for a fee every month, I'll cut my company checks to pay your bills. And in three years, he handled $28 million, he told me. Um, and I said, this is a civil case. They're suing you for records. They haven't threatened you with criminal charges, have they yet? And he says, no. I said, that's because once they do, you can claim the Fifth Amendment. Until they mention that, you got to turn over all your records. You're going to lose this civil case. The best I could do is try to blow it up so that they don't want to touch it by bringing criminal charges later. That's all I can try to do. I think I've succeeded. Uh, I haven't looked back to see if he ultimately was indicted. This is the chief judge, Robert Lasnik. Robert S. Lasnik, at this time, he was chief judge in Washington, uh, U.S. District Court, Western District of Washington, Seattle. Hey, the regulation 1.1-1 deviates from statute. And number two, I think they got all their authority by writing that regulation. Here's the response of the court. This is after they issued the protective order in 2005 in Walden versus U.S. He sued the government for a, basically, answers to this challenge. Uh, proof that he's wrong about this challenge. Prove your authority. I can prove you don't have it. You got it through regulation alone. And they issued a protective order against the argument. Well, that went on to the record in 2008 in U.S. versus Arand in Seattle. He joined the complaint in Congress in 2007 and put it on the record. And so they knew that they can't issue another protective order. It's now being used as evidence in a criminal complaint to 80 members of Congress. What are they going to say now about the argument? This is the first thing that happened after that 2005 case in Texas. This is the first one. The first reply they went on record with after the protective order was issued. Here it is. Chief Judge Robert Lasnik says, this is the entirety of the decision. Denying the motion to dismiss. A motion to dismiss the civil case was filed saying, hey, it all comes from this regulation. And this is the judge's opinion. The first paragraph is simply him saying what the argument was. The second paragraph is the entirety of his decision. Order denying motion to dismiss. This matter comes before the court on the motion of defendant Robert A. Rant to dismiss for failure to state a claim upon which relief may be granted. A. Rant, who is proceeding pro se, argues that the United States of America has no statutory authority to act against him. Exactly. And then he quotes, the Secretary of the Treasury has imposed a tax on the defendant through 26 CFR 1.1-1C but has done so without the authority to do so, the authority to lay income taxes having been reserved to Congress and Congress alone. Okay, that's great. That's a sentence out of the argument. It was fully briefed. Then, he starts with a quote from a case about the assessment of taxes, not the imposition of taxes. Section 1 imposes a tax. This is about the authority to take his money. It's about theft. They have assessment authority. Yes, they do. 6201A. But this isn't about assessment. This is about the fact the tax is imposed by a regulation. However, the IRS is given the authority to assess taxes. See Law Office Jonathan Stein v. Cadle Company, 9th Circuit, 2001. Citing 6201 through 6204, that's about the assessment of taxes, not about how they're imposed. And see also McLaughlin versus IRS, uh, tax protesters, those who persist in pressing losing arguments, why did the argument lose? Because you don't want to talk about it? Makes it a losing argument? 
in an attempt to challenge the legitimacy of the federal income tax are a thorn in the side of the federal judiciary. Discussing IRS's authority. It wasn't the same argument, I promise you. I looked up the case. I've read these cases. They have nothing to do with whether or not 1.1-1 deviates from Section 1. ARENT may not agree with that authority, but nevertheless, it exists. Accordingly, defendant's motion to dismiss is denied. Footnote number one. The government has responded to the motion with a single sentence, noting that the motion is a frivolous pleading to which no further response from the United States is required. In the future, the government should look beyond the frivolous nature of ARAN's filings and respond substantively. So, oh, all of this is frivolous, but we can't talk about whether or not 1.1-1 deviates from Section 1. So, uh, he filed a motion to reconsider, and it was basically just a middle finger, saying, oh, we expected nothing more from this court. And remember, my job was to blow the case up in the faces of the prosecution so they didn't want to touch it later with criminal charges. That's all I was trying to do. So he filed a motion to dismiss that was a middle finger. It wasn't profane, but it was discussed. We expected nothing, uh, uh, this and that. Oh, the court has run from the decision. It has nothing to do with the authority to assess taxes. Uh, you're derelict in your decision, or you're just plain evasive. Uh, and we expect, or I expect nothing less from uh, this officer of this court, having read the decisions against him, period. And then... He cited U.S. versus David Lanier, but took out David Lanier and put in Lasnik, the judge's last name. David Lanier was a Tennessee, a Tennessee chancery judge hearing divorce cases who invited women from time to time to his chamber to discuss their divorce case, possible employment with the court, or uh, details about how to handle child custody matters in their divorce and he took to orally raping them against the door of his chambers and was indicted federally for violating their rights. Real seedy dude. Uh, the, the courts protected him. The Sixth Circuit said, yeah, there's no Supreme Court case that has even come close to this set of facts before. So the statute prohibiting violation of rights under color of law doesn't really warn him in advance that it would violate this statute, uh, violate their rights to rape them. 18 U.S.C. 242, violation of rights under color of law. There's nothing that would normally tell them in advance that raping them would violate their rights. And the Supreme Court had to straighten them out. The other case that Mr. Arant cited, having read the decisions against this judge, and he cited the David Lanier case, then he cites State of Oklahoma versus Thompson, Thompson was a judge found guilty of three counts, I think, of uh, indecent exposure using a penis pump while presiding over a murder trial, uh, mur the murder of a toddler, uh, and his clerk testified that, yeah, she had witnessed that, uh, that employment of that device during trial. And pe other people said they could hear it uh, functioning, this pump, and took out Thompson from the title of the case and put in Lasnik. <laughs> and uh, there was a court order issued. The clerk is hereby ordered to redact that paragraph. Robert A. Rant, the defendant in this civil case, is hereby penalized a $1,000 for misrepresenting willfully authorities on the record. And he filed a motion to reconsider, saying, hey, reconsider. Come on, you did it first. You gave us authorities that totally dodged the issue. They came nowhere close to deciding whether or not 1.1-1 deviates from Section 1. I thought that was your invitation to present 
uh, false authorities onto the record just like you did. Come on. No, no thousand dollar penalty for me, please. <laughs> and uh, of course, they kept the penalty in place. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, my job was to blow the case up in their faces. He filed a motion for curative instruction early in the case saying, well, if they can't even deny their authority comes from regulation, I want to know if I can bring firearms into the courtroom to arrest him under this state statute that allows me to arrest a felon. Oh, a startled silence fell over the courtroom. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it, the job was to stay in their faces, and that's what I did. So, so here's the regulation. Uh, the statute doesn't say citizen at all, section one of the code. And you can pause any time you want. Here we have an, a, an array of case, a plethora of cases that say that regulation. You can't get them to talk about the imposition of the section one tax without citing that regulation. It goes everywhere they do. This is in the key to the code video. So you don't need it here. Watch the key to the code video. And when we come to, this is Court of Appeals, 6th Circuit, CA, Court of Appeals. And watch what they say on the 7th Circuit in the Vallone decision. That he was neither a citizen nor resident of the United States, as those terms are used in the 14th Amendment, or 26 CFR 1.1-1C. The IRS regulation defending or identifying those persons who are subject to income tax by the United States. Right. Valone wrote a letter saying he's a sovereign citizen, that he was neither a citizen or resident of the United States, as in this regulation that identifies the subject of the tax. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm alleging. And this is a Court of Appeals decision. It's not U.S. District Court. Okay. Now we're going to get through this. Watch the Key to the Code video if you want to read these. And by Take from Caesar, Volume 2. That's the supplemental briefing filed in uh, 014. Conclusion. Ask the Department of Justice, he's talking to the grand jury, ask the Department of Justice to display the text of tax code section 1 and to identify for the record congressional tax or congressional intent to tax a particular citizen's income. It, uh, Congress has never said so. And here, Supreme Court case is saying you simply can't add to a statute something that's not there when you write a regulation. The grand jury letter. This is a Supreme Court case, uh, 2001, United Dominion Industries versus U.S. When the tax gatherer puts his finger on the citizen, he must also put his finger on the law permitting it. And he better wear rubber gloves, because I don't need any of that rubbing off on me. And then there's issue two, section 83, Here's all the case law that says so. This is why the grand jury can't see this. See? It's, a, it's exculpatory purely and uh, will not be given to the grand jury. And so he tells the grand jury, <clears throat> It is for these reasons I strongly urge that you subpoena me and the researcher who wrote the briefing in the attached memorandum, me, before putting me through the destruction of my so, do da day. <clears throat> Here we go. Now, uh, as you are aware, you are a target of a federal grand jury. Yeah. Tax evasion, 7201, 7212, corruptly endeavoring to impede the due administration. Corruptly. That means what you're doing has to be illegal. Corrupt means criminality. Well, he had different LLCs. He legally sold real estate out from under liens. It was all legal. They don't allege that, it, I've never seen it alleged that it was criminal. They might say, conspiracy to defraud the United States. It all hinges on, there has to be a liability. 
and the law cannot be vague or highly debatable. If it's vague or highly debatable, that's exculpatory evidence. Show the law to the grand jury. How did Section 83 operate? That's exculpatory. The law is vague or highly debatable. They don't say that to the grand jury. According to your letter dated on the 13th of February, you wish to testify before the grand jury. In order for you to be allowed to testify, the following conditions must be met. You must explicitly waive your privilege against self-incrimination on the record before the grand jury. You must either be represented by counsel or voluntarily and knowingly appear without counsel. Uh, you must consent to full examination under oath. Okay. Anything that you do, uh, anything that you do say during your grand jury testimony may be used against you by the grand jury or in a subsequent legal proceeding. If you testify falsely, you can be prosecuted for perjury or obstruction of justice, each a felony. Yeah, and if the prosecutor doesn't give exculpatory evidence to the uh, grand jury, they don't act alone. That's a conspiracy against his rights. If you have proof he's innocent and you don't show it to the grand jury, that's a felony. Also, I want to remind you that your appearance before the grand jury is fully within the discretion of the grand jury. You have no legal right to appear before the grand jury. If you answer the questions posed by the U.S. and the members of the grand jury directly and responsibly, you will be given the opportunity to make a short statement. If you do not directly and responsibly answer the questions presented, you will not be given the opportunity to make a statement. You have no legal right to make a statement. Your ability to give a statement is within the full discretion of the grand jury. And then the DOJ dictates the time limits. <laughs> full discretion of the grand jury, but it's only going to be 15 minutes, according to me. Due to time, constra uh, time constraints of the grand jury, I thought it was their discretion. This statement will be limited to no more than 15 minutes. You will not have the opportunity to ask questions of the prosecution of the grand jury during your appearance. It's my understanding that you are not a, uh, represented by an attorney in this matter. You should be aware that if you do not obtain an attorney, you have the right to consult with your attorney during your testimony if you find it necessary to do so. Your attorney, however, may not appear with you in the grand jury room. If you do retain an attorney, Please have your attorney contact me as soon as possible to inform me of your representation. The time is set, Duda Day, yesterday, February 17th. Great. And so, he appeared before the grand jury. You'll hear in the recording that he's a nice guy. He's nicer than I could ever be especially before the grand jury, but in any matter related to income taxation because of how much I know and how much I've seen. Uh, I wish that he had bristled a bit more at the government than he in fact did, but he got everything said, I think he said 10 or 12 minutes, and uh, I'm not going to have a comment at the end of the uh, recording of the interview we did with him on a call couple hours after he got out of the meeting with the grand jury, he wanted to decompress a while, relax, gather his thoughts, and uh, then we conducted the call. So, uh, once again, this is a, uh, a man who appeared before the grand jury yesterday morning, February 27th, 2018, and uh, uh, did very well. Uh, my hat's off to the guy, and hopefully, you know, get enough on the record to convince the grand jury, you know, subpoena the guy. Subpoena the guy that wrote the letter to you. Subpoena Dave Merlin. I could do all this on accident. I don't need notes for any of it. So, please do. I can't wait. So anyway, here's the recording of the uh, gentleman about his appearance before the grand jury. Uh, my products are available on wevgov.com. And uh, I'll see you in the next episode of Codebreaker. Thanks very much for your support. Hi, this is David Merland. Welcome to an interview with Jack, we'll call him today, for the purposes of this call. He, this morning, met with a grand jury investigating him for alleged tax crimes. And the DOJ said, yes, you can come in and testify before the grand jury. You have to waive certain rights. 
and you have to make full disclosure on all of our questions, and then you'll get 15 minutes to, uh, to tell your side of the story, and this was a reply to the letter he sent to the grand jury asking for such an opportunity. Uh, Jack, welcome to the call. We don't need your state, your name, your address, nothing personal. Uh, this is simply about uh, a citizen out there who got the opportunity to appear before a grand jury uh, with knowledge of particular statutes of interest mostly uh, for the purposes of this morning was going to be Section 83. Hi, Jack. Are you decompressed after the uh, the intense uh, encounter this morning with the Department of Justice and grand jury? I think so. I'm still, uh, still decompressing, but uh, getting there for sure. Okay, well, the floor is yours. Uh, start at the top and uh, try to follow a timeline uh, to the end. And anything of interest that came up, uh, feel free to mention it, and I'll try uh, really not to interrupt you at all. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so as a result of the uh, letter um, that I had sent to the Department of Justice, uh, requesting a, an appearance before the grand jury, uh, which was investigating uh, crimes against me. Um, I was granted the opportunity to uh, answer questions and uh, give a 15-minute uh, statement at the end, which I, uh, which I did today. So I arrived at the, uh, at the courthouse around uh, 9.30 or so, uh, escorted into a conference room and waited. The district at attorney came over um, introduced herself with two other individuals and said that they were they were interviewing one witness before me and that I you know just wait and um, which I did so they called me in at approximately 11 a.m. Um, grand jury was already seated the grand jury foreman was a uh, african-american woman um, uh, sitting to the left of me um, jury consisted I didn't count the exact number but it was probably um there was probably at least 20 people there 2022 20, maybe um half women half men <laughs> um the uh, department of justice uh began with uh advising me that I was waiving some of my rights and that they you know and as I said could could be used against me um you know um or in further proceedings as they had mentioned I, I remember that so they um, they started um, you know they started with um, showing me various um, 1099s, um, trying to key in on the amount and the year. Um, when they made me verify the amount, I said, uh, you know, I made it a a very good point that you know listed under non-employee compensation you know, was the amount. Um, and so we went through several years of that. They asked me when I had last filed, um, and I verified the years of 2004 through uh, eight, perhaps, uh, of which I did amended returns after original filings and um, hadn't filed since um, 2010 to, to current year. Um they went on to uh, show various um, commission checks that I had received from a uh, company out of the country um, for some services that I had performed for them. And um, I verified each of those amounts as compensation. Um, we, you know, they went on to... Um, show me a spreadsheet that I had prepared uh, back from an incident in 2012 um, which I had um, uh, which I was grow I was a uh, legal uh, caregiver for marijuana in the, in the state and um, they showed the spreadsheet of that I was keeping track of the sales that I was doing and the amounts and they made me verify them which I I did um, and then, um, you know, there was uh, various questions that the, there was two Department of Justice officials there, the attorney, assistant U.S. attorney, and another 
um, person, and um, they had a three-ring binder full of uh, exhibits that they were putting on the overhead projector, and I assume it came through on the screen in front of me and must have shown been shown to the uh, jurors as well of the various documents as they were asking me about them. Um, I answered almost every question with, um, you know, it is my understanding, my belief and understanding of, of the law of Section 83 that, you know, the amounts that you're referencing are, in fact, compensation for services. I see it no other way. I've studied the law. Um, I, you know, researched it and, um, you know, can only can only honestly say that I truly believe that it was um, compensation for services. Uh, there was an occasion where they uh, brought up some um, checks that I had sent um, several years ago um, following the um, accepted for value method that the checks were never returned, but um, several of them were, were to the Internal Revenue Service and none of them were returned to me. Um, they had, um, remarkably, they had the fronts and the backs of the checks. And when they were asking me to verify the dates and the amounts on the checks, um, I asked him to scroll. He was uh, magnifying the image of just the front part of the check, and I asked him to show me the back side of the check, and he reluctantly moved it over, but right on the back, on the endorsement portion, was uh, do not deposit um, uh, EFT only without recourse and my signature. Um, they asked me if the account was a an open account. I says, no. I says, according to my study of the law and the statutes, it was um, to be on a closed account, and closed accounts remained open, according to statute as I read it and understood it. Closed accounts would remain open and uh, be used only for the purposes of discharge of debt. So after I did that, I had heard nothing from anyone. Um, when the checks first arrived at the Internal Revenue Service, they released a lien because they must have, I don't know what they did with the checks, but they did something with them. It made the lien that they had on my, my home release. And then um, several months later, the lien was reinstated. So... <coughs> um, but I, you know, I made it clear to the uh, to the jury that, um, you know, I never heard nothing back. The checks were never returned. Um, you know, they were meant to be what they were, and that was that. Um, I did um, on more than one occasion um, to both the grand jury foreman and others, um, you know, um, suggest that they subpoena um, Dave Merlin to come in and, you know, expand on what I was telling them about my knowledge of the understanding of 83A, and he could certainly tell more on, he's been studying it for many more years than I have, and he's an expert on the subject, and I invited them to uh, subpoena the U.S. Assistant Attorney um, said that the grand jury has um, unlimited subpoena powers, and I believe I remarked, um, "Well, that would be that would be a good thing if they were to actually subpoena him." And um, um, it was, you know, less than an hour. It was a lot of back and forth, a little bit of um, um, a little bit of confrontation with the assistant U.S. attorney who I had dealt with before. Um, you know, she tried to stop me from answering questions. I reiterated my answers, um, and then she moved on. So when there was something that she didn't like what I was saying, she quickly changed subject, and, um, you know, I just had to change gears for that. Um, at the um, 
at the end of it, and even a couple times during the um, during the uh, the incident, um, the several members of the grand jury, she, the assistant U.S. attorney, would ask the jurors if anyone had a question uh, from time to time, and unbelievably, there was four to five people that um, asked me questions. Um, she had to actually stop me because I was getting a little bit into a lot of things on the law and she says that you know the department of justice would uh dictate the law to them or to tell them what the law was so she tried to stop me at certain points when i tried to um reference court cases i did mention the um uh the sitzer case um you know having a good faith understanding of the law I uh, did get into detail about uh, U.S. versus Monsanto, the heroin dealer, um, you know, about the, the, the term all, you know, how it's all-inclusive, um, how the Department of Justice had won four cases, um, you know, about the word. And, you know, I use that knowledge and reference as, you know, my understanding and, and action on, applying section 83a to to my situation uh my 15 minutes um interview at the end um went fairly well i had the uh floor i retrieved from my briefcase which i was allowed to bring in um a, a series of documents that i had copied last evening and uh was prepared to give to the grand jury foreman um she wouldn't let me um, you know, I know that it was exculpatory evidence, and I should have. I didn't know how to do it, and I didn't want to be, you know, I, I just, it was in a situation where I didn't know what to do next, and so I I invited the grand jury foreman to, um, you know, please subpoena me for all of my records and research that I have done um, on this subject, I, I, I've got a lot of information. I'm not sure if the Department of Justice is sharing it with you. They should, um, by all means, because that would prove my innocence. And, um, you know, uh, the grand jury foreman was not very responsive. She was sitting there. I, I, she, you know, I just, I didn't get the a warm fuzzy feeling that she was going to but there very well could be those five jurors that were asking questions and you know getting into some detail um it's probably it may be one of them that will certainly ask her to you know to subpoena the records and um you know get either me in there or back in there to to show them um there was one gentleman that asked me um you know what my um understanding of income was and i says well it's very simple i i says the the law was written to protect all of us and if you apply the law as it is written as congress wrote it and enacted it it's right there it's 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 black and white it's in print it's very succinct and and decisive and you know, section, I said, section 61, um, oh, the attorney asked me, did, did I ever uh, have a CPA um, prepare my returns? And I I said, maybe way back when, but, you know, I found that I could not find in a, a um, you know, a knowledgeable enough CPA that understood some of the things that I was researching. And she quizzed me specifically on the CPA that our company was using, and they had already had him in there, um, you know, for three hours, I think. And I remember him pointing out 61A, you know, income from all sources, you know. And and I said, well, you know, so I said to the jurors, I said, you know, there's, there's four important words at the very start of 61A. And, 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 they, and they are, except as otherwise provided. And to me, that simply meant there's more to this section than 61A, and that led me to 83A. And, you know, when I understood that and saw that it was all compensation 
for services, be it an employee or an independent contractor, my feeling is that I had to apply that section rather than the, the previous section because that section showed, you know, more to specifically what I was and, and who I was. So, <laughs> um, so I was able to get a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the the the, the root of eighty three A out there and. You know, as I looked up at the jurors when I was talking about it, um, they were very intent on hearing that, which which I felt was really good. Um, you know, the, the, the Department of Justice is just, you know, pure evil, and they, you know, will try to um, paint the worst possible picture of a person. I, mean, I suppose that's their job. That's what they're they're drilled to do and trained to do, but... Um, you know, it's my hope that uh, I left the jury and the grand jury and the and the grand jury foreman with um, with a little bit of doubt as to you know whether the charges were valid or not. And you know, more than once I you know explained the you know my understanding of the law and you know the the innocence factor. So. Um, you know, it's it's just such a trying experience. All in all, I I I, I feel that it went all right, um, but then another part of me says, who knows what will happen? Um, you know, they could uh, they could very well do nothing, or they very well could um, you know bring bring forth an indictment. You you just don't know what's going to happen. But I'll be prepared either one, either way to to do it. But it's. Um, I think it went well. Um, I, you know, being that I was in there less than an hour, I think that they, the Department of Justice, um, saw where I was going with things and, you know, wanted to cut my time. You know, they got the, the meat of what they wanted to get done, but I think they felt that if they kept me there <laughs> too much longer and people started asking questions, it would have been detrimental to them so i i think they uh in fact uh maybe shortened it a bit because she like threw put me right into the 15 minute thing and uh and that went well i maybe spent 10 minutes or a little bit longer but um you know i i suggested suggested strongly that they they you know subpoena dave merlin because he will explain this better than the Department of Justice or anything you're going to be able to find anywhere else. He's studied it. He's learned it. He's, you know, he can, he can do more justice to this than, uh, than anyone. And, you know, I think it's important that you look at all parts of the, um, of the evidence before you make any decisions. And that's, uh, what's that? I have a question. Were you allowed to give anything at all to the grand jury of particular interest for my purposes is the uh, James Beck trial memorandum from the Department of Justice in L14 no when I when I took them out of my briefcase and um, and uh, asked the grand jury foreman if uh, if they would like a copy she didn't respond at all and sent uh, the assistant US attorney um, Said you can't give them any documents. I want to try to get a copy of that uh, of the uh, yeah of the transcript at that point, of the meeting. At that point, I would have reiterated what they said in the letter. Um, my side of the story. This is my side of the story. You didn't say it couldn't be in document. Yeah. Anyway, um, it sounds like they accommodated you reasonably, and. Uh, um, it does sound like you made a reasonable uh, portrayal of your reliance upon the law. And uh, without that James Back trial memorandum, uh, it's tougher, really, to get the whole point across. All they have is your demeanor and the fact that you mentioned law. In, uh, did they acknowledge that they had received the letter that you sent requesting this hearing? Uh, they did not receive it. 
Man, that was important. That see that at least that letter you should have been permitted to give them, and I would have made a much bigger deal about the fact that the evidence is exculpatory. And if the prosecutor doesn't give that, did you read the uh, U.S. Attorney's Manual about exculpatory evidence? I sent you that link. I did. I did. Yeah. Okay. If they don't give exculpatory evidence to the grand jury, they could get in trouble with the appellate court, according to that uh, particular entry in the U.S. Attorney's Manual. Uh, So anyway, to conclude the interview about this morning, Jack, uh, uh, overall, sounds like you did very well. And uh, what I would have done differently is uh, anger. (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're sedate compared to the way I would have presented myself. I, I would have thrown the burden of proof at them instead of merely shifted. And um, I do hope they subpoena me for uh, an appearance because uh, in, in no uncertain terms and in a very short order, uh, I can overpower anybody they bring in to try to contradict me. And I can do it without yeah. notes. So... So hopefully this isn't over, and uh, all the best, of course, I hope comes of this. And for anybody else that picks up this recording, this is uh, February 27th, 2018. The meeting with the Department of Justice took place this morning with the grand jury, and Jack has just given you his account of uh, how it went. So uh, thanks very much, Jack, for your time, and uh, we'll try to... uh, keep track of this of course and uh, you feel free to call my office anytime thanks again all right thank you but i want to say one thing to the american people i want you to listen to me i'm going to say this again i did have sexual relations with senator mccain and senator obama everybody there with a horse senator obama george bush my daughter and son-in-law the president of namibia an american president a great athlete the republicans too many people a lot of people here, anybody who worked for me, the lame duck, uh, Governor Scott, Governor Chris, the people who were against us, people who were for us, almost 100 percent of the Democrats that I campaign with, the people who would be most influenced, poster boy, Senator Udall with Republicans, the Simpson Bowles Budget Commission, the president, the 10th most conservative member of the House, the moderate, the guy who, who did it, the people who really cared about that, the undecided voters at the end. You drop down low, scrape the shin, and then you hit him in the crown jewels with the knee. That's what you do. Okay. And then you then you run as fast as possible. There we go. I say good show.